one thing is for sure, it makes me a little nervous, but I see all of your eyes. And that brings me exactly to the topic that I'm talking about today. Because your eyes do not tell me how much you like or dislike my talk, but much rather can also show us important information for specific research fields, like human-machine interaction, which can make websites or interfaces more usable and user-friendly. But let me give you an example so you know what I'm talking about. I think you've all been in this situation. Your old phone broke, or you just want a new one. So you look up some phones online, and what you see is a color palette and two options to choose from. And that's pretty much what you're told in marketing, that your product should be targeted towards the biggest group of people. However, that target audience never fits everybody. So if you're a tech-savvy guy that's not interested in colors because you'll buy your phone in black anyways, then maybe you're more interested in seeing the specs over a bright palette. And this is exactly where I want to take you today, that maybe your eye movements can empower computers to automatically detect what kind of view you would prefer. So maybe in the future you would be presented the right one if you want it so. But before I get into my details, I need to give you a brief introduction into human-computer interaction, and I'll keep it short, no worries. Um, the basic concept means that a user that's interacting with a device gives some sort of input. And then the device, which nowadays mostly have graphical user interface, gives feedback. For example, in the sense that something changes based on your input. But the problem is, the interaction in between is quite hard to measure. I can ask you questions, but just imagine yourself. I'll give you a task, I'll hand you a new piece of software, and in the end, you'll be working 30 seconds or 30 minutes on a specific topic, and afterwards, I'll ask you how you felt during your first two minutes. You'll most likely not give an accurate representation of how you felt there. So, how can we change that? I can interrupt you after every task, but then I would also interrupt the natural interaction. Therefore, we use eye tracking. Because eye tracking is a way in which we can record your interaction with a computer in lifetime and also measure specific things like perception, distractions, important elements, and many more. But we'll come back to that in a brief moment. First of all, how do those eye trackers work? Because most of you probably have never heard of one, let alone seen one. And if you look on the left side, there is a bar mounted underneath the monitor. That's the kind of eye trackers we use in our laboratory. So those eye trackers have specific cameras and lights, and those are infrared lights. So these infrared lights project light into your eyes, which, no worries, we as humans cannot see the infrared spectrum, therefore we cannot see this light. But the cameras can, and they can pick something up called a corneal reflection. And that's where the light is reflected in your eye. And based on where your pupil is and where that reflection lies, a software can calculate where on the screen you're looking at. But how do we look? Because if I show you this website, most of you have probably seen it. It's the TEDx uh, website of Regensburg. And that's pretty much the way you've seen it last time. But the truth is, you have not. While we have a quite big field of view, our foveal field of view, in which we can actually process information reliable, is quite small. So if we wanted to read the home button, we would have to focus on it. And then when we want to look at something else, we have to move on until we arrived at our information, and then we can process that again. And so on, and so on. And what I've showed you here is the core principle of eye tracking. It's called a scan path. And a scan path just displays where a specific person is looking to. So you see the one, that's where the person started, then you see number two and number three. And that's the way they started looking, and the size says how long you've spent time looking at this point. And what I've just explained you are so-called fixations and saccades. Saccades are the movements in between those points, the fixations, and during those movements, you're pretty much blind because they happen so fast that you cannot process any information reliably in between. So the only time you pick up information and you are actually thinking about something in your brain is when you are looking at specific points, at fixations. 
And there are a couple of different metrics. For example, we can take those fixations, combine them into a heat map, and give you a representation of where you spend the most time looking at. Or you can define areas of interest, which are most important for us researchers, because then we can measure how long it takes a participant, for example, in order to arrive at a specific area. But let's not get into too much detail. Just an information for you. The eye trackers that are deployed in our laboratory can measure over 200 different metrics. So that's just the tip of the iceberg. And why does eye tracking work? Well, eye tracking works because there's something called an eye mind hypothesis. This eye mind hypothesis has been proven in linguistic sciences and basically says what I've explained to you before. When you're focusing at a specific object, in this case a cat, then your brain is automatically processing this information. So you're looking at the cat, you're thinking at the cat. And let's jump into linguistic science so you know what I'm talking about. I brought a paper with me that I just stumbled across recently, and they have a pretty good explanation. They gave two different people, or a general a group of people, sentences to read. And the first one says there are concerns over the company's proximity to the Chinese government, while the second one says, however, some countries are already preparing for the next year. Many of you probably already recognized that the first sentence is much harder. Because we have specific constructs, we are not used to in our language. Because the uh, apostrophe at companies and the word proximity are quite hard. Proximity is not necessarily in beginner's vocabulary. So this is where the participant spent the most time looking at. Because he had to make sense of the word. Because he didn't understand proximity right away, that person had to think what the translation to proximity would be. And when we have a simpler sentence, we just flow along. It happens naturally. But that's pretty academic. I think I need to give you an example that all of you know about. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, it's displayed here again. That's the Star Wars intro. That's displayed before every movie. Why am I picking that up? For a pretty simple reason. Another paper analyzed it using eye tracking. And they put two different groups of people in front of the intro. And they asked them to read it while it was scrolling along. One group was native to English, and the other one was a learner. So I need your participant right here. For every one of you who thinks the left side is the native speaker, please raise your hand now. One hand, two, three, four. OK, let's say less than 10 hands. That's less than 10% of you. And those 10% were right. Why? Because the left one clearly seems messed up while the right one is all ordered, but that's actually how we read. Think about your own language. When you read something in German, you start at a specific point, but you do not need to read each word in order to understand the meaning. So we can clearly see that the English learner had to read every single word in order to make sense of the sentence. And coming back to usability, where I actually wanted to add, in this paper, they used this information and said, people are fixating words they have trouble understanding. So they implemented a live tool where people could read series with subtitles, because that's how we learn languages nowadays. And they found out here that the person had problems with two words, dehydrated and fluorescent. Same as proximity, not easy words to understand. So they gave the natural translation, in this case in Chinese, because Chinese was where that study was done. But getting away from text, let's get into something that we all know about, search strategies. Another paper gave participants a group of four pictures. And the task was they were supposed to identify the picture that's related to sports. And as we can see, on the left side, there is no picture of sports while on the right side, there is one. What does that look like if we take away the pictures? Well, we have one scan path that's pretty short and that ends abruptly, while the other one starts at the top left, goes clockwise until they scanned all pictures, realizing there is none related to sports, but they are not sure yet, so they go back around counterclockwise. And because we know who of those people had the picture related to sports, we know that probably the first scan path 
is connected to a user that does not need support because that person found what they were looking for. And the other scan path is probably a user that's confused why there is no picture related to sports. And that's pretty easy to understand if we take it to a website, for example. All of you have been there. You look for some information, but it's not right there, so you keep scrolling and looking through the page, and you don't find what you're looking for. Maybe in the future, there are eye trackers that automatically realize you are the bottom user, so you need support. Then you're getting support in, for example, the way of a chatbot or some actual support by a human, but you get help because you look confused. And that's all the information we have in eye tracking. Only I kept a little secret from you. As I've shown before, over 90% of you got this example wrong, thought that the top one was the English learner. So in eye tracking science, we need something right here. And this is called triangulation. Because from the eye tracking data alone, we cannot assume how good the language level is. We need something else to confirm that information. Most of the time that's done in for example, a questionnaire, a think aloud method, or an interview. And when we gave those people an, an questionnaire and we asked them to write their English skills, we can get a pretty accurate representation because the first one would probably say, I'm native to English, or at least quite good, while the other one would say, mm, I'm new to English, I'm not necessarily that familiar with the language. So we need triangulation in order to make sense of eye tracking data. And talking about eye tracking data, think about what I've told you before. Our eye trackers can take up to 200 metrics, and the fastest one we own can record at 1,200 hertz a second. That's 1,200 data points recorded every single second. You are 100 people, so just imagine you would have done an eye tracking study in parallel to my talk, because that goes on for roughly 15 minutes by now. If all of you had done an eye tracking study in parallel, we would have over 21 and a half billion data points just in this single room. And what can we do with that? Maybe we can take this eye tracking data, apply machine learning, which for everybody who's not familiar with it, is a technique where we just discover uh, certain patterns in data and Maybe there's something called a UX type. You all know that there are specific learning types that different people prefer different visualizations or prefer text. And maybe based on that information, we can adapt graphical interfaces. So one would appreciate a video. Why not give him a video? Another person does not work with videos at all. They prefer text because they want to read. Well, OK, then let's put the video down at the front where ca they can still see it but not necessarily stumble across it until they read the text. So quite the view into the future, where are we with eye tracking? As I said before, most of you have probably never seen an eye tracker, or so you thought. How many of you do know this symbol? Okay, more than the 10% we had earlier. For those of you who don't know, According to a recent study, 50% of you should know. Because what you see right here is something called Face ID. That's a technology that was implemented by Apple, and it allows you to unlock your phone. And I think you can guess how that works. I'll give you a hint. Infrared cameras and infrared lights. For those of you who haven't figured it out yet, they introduced it in 2017. Coincidentally, just Six months prior, they bought one of the biggest vendors in the technology field of eye tracking, and their patent, of course. So maybe the very next time, maybe even in our break, you'll open your phone and you'll think a little bit different about it, and you'll see exactly what's behind that bar. And if you think about that, then that's all I wanted to achieve today. Thank you. Mm.